Live. Hello everyone, welcome to today's workshop by Datastax developers. Hello Before everyone. Before we start, I would like you to uh, give me a thumbs up if you can hear my voice well and clear, no echoes. So please, can you confirm your hearing us? Can you hear both of us? And also that you can hear uh, very good. Uh, Thumbs up, so both of us. So I think we can That's start so far, so we'll keep an eye, but it uh, looks like we are good. Okay, so very good. Hi, everyone. Today is uh, a very cool workshop. You will do a lot of things hands-on, and uh, let's start. First, uh, introduction. I'm Stefano, nice to meet you. I'm a developer advocate at Datastax, and my main interest is uh, web Python and all things about Python. I also uh, have a great interest in uh, Apache Cassandra, distributed systems. I used to be a physicist, and uh, yeah, this is me. So please connect with me. Uh, you see my, my social media coordinates here, and uh, I would be glad to connect with you. What about you, Artem? Hi, everybody. I'm Artem. Uh, I'm a data architect and computer scientist. and. Uh, I've been working with all kinds of databases, pretty much uh, every type of database. Uh, and uh, uh, recently, uh, we are also looking at machine learning uh, problems. And, and this workshop, I'm very excited about it because it's, it's, it's just the beginning of what we are going to do yes, in the future. That's very true. It's it in the world, right? <laughs> Especially in the last days. Okay, so uh, this workshop is the result of not just the two of us today uh, on screen, but it comes from, a, of course, a lot of work by the full team here. So we thank all of them and hello. Some of them are probably in uh, the YouTube chat as well as the Discord chat, but I'm getting ahead of myself. So hi, everyone. And uh, yeah, so um, before starting, we have a great announcement that has to do with machine learning and in general, uh, data man modern data management so um, just last week cascada has become open source you see here a screenshot of the of the code on github what is cascada you will ask uh, well it's a very uh, powerful and modern uh, state-of-the-art event processing and time series engine uh, that allows very sophisticated uh, batch and uh, stream so live um, and Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, you can, you can do stateful aggregation of, of on your stream. You can do continuous expression. 
you can join multiple streams and so on. And it's actually yes. very related. Stefana is gonna talk about it in more detail at the end of workshop, how we can yeah. use Cascada to improve something that- Yes, so more in general, today. probably Cascada is, very, uh, is a very powerful tool with many of the modern ML applications because it, it deals with real time uh, in a very sp specific way. And uh, it's also well suited for time series uh, operations. So yeah, you will see later how, for example, Cascada might fit in, but uh, let's move on. So today we have a packed agenda. You will do a lot of things. As I mentioned, you will probably learn a few things. Um, so we will first uh, look a bit at uh, what is the best way to, to get results. What is the best uh, way to do this workshop with us today? And then we will go to the content, looking at what is our general goal, what is the architecture we want to implement, and how. Then uh, we will go to more detail by looking at the database. We use how to set it up, how it works. Then we will speak a lot about AI, which is, in a sense, the core topic of today. Even though, in a sense, the, the, the really core topic of today is not just is not much AI in itself, but uh, uh, an even harder problem in a sense, that is how to properly bring AI to production in the right way. Because you probably know that uh, according to statistics, you see around most of the AI projects never see the dawn of production. And there might be several reasons behind that. Let's say properly bringing AI to production is a challenge in itself. And then we will close by uh, showing what might be the next step for you. So that's more or less where, what we are going to do. And before, uh, before looking into the content, we have introduced ourselves. So now it's your, your turn and we have a nice interactive interface to get to know our audience a little more. And that's Mentimeter, which we will also use by the end of the workshop to, uh, to have a fun quiz about what you learned. But first things first, I would like to ask you to go to menti.com with uh, your phone or maybe a tab, another browser tab. You go to menti.com, please, and enter the code that you see here in the chat, in the YouTube chat, that is 93284371. You will be able, if I manage to start menti, that is, you will be able to join our interactive presentation and uh, help us with yeah knowing you okay i see some thumbs up appearing on the bottom right corner already that's good uh, even though i have to say i've seen something mice have frozen here that's not nice Artem, are you still online? I might have experienced a freeze up of my... I'm still online and I think uh, you are okay. on YouTube as well. That's so. uh, unfortunate because I think I have some local trouble at the moment. Okay, we're just having a uh, looks like small my computer technical is... issue, but slowing down very much that might not be nice ah that's very unfortunate i might have to to do something very ugly you see i have a frozen monitor so on youtube it looks everything looks okay fine so and they, they can hear us so we uh, try I, to continue. I can't reach the, you know i can't reach the controls of um of the streaming at this point. <laughs> That's not very nice, right? Okay. Yeah. I think I might have to start everything again, which is very unfortunate, but looks like my browser is got, going crazy, you know? That's a problem. I can't see what's going on. Okay. Not nice. Um, 
I might have to reboot some things, you know? That's control. Yeah, we skip uh, maybe? probably we should. Maybe. But I have a broader problem at this point because I, I can't reach the other half of my monitor. <laughs> Oops, that's very bad. I wonder what's going on. No, this machine is gone. That's not nice. Okay, so. Is there any chance you I can share my screen? I can't reach the can streaming software at this point. Okay. Trying to look what might be a solution. Uh, okay. So I think if uh, Alex is offering to take over hosting, and uh, that might be the only solution. So, okay. Artyom, you should share the Skype call with Alex and we go on with the slides and while he takes over. But, uh, but I have to stop streaming yes. probably, okay. which I can't. So that's, you know, I have no idea how to solve this, but I don't, I don't have access to any communication at this point, unless I reboot my computer, which is something I would postpone. So maybe we can just, I can go forward. Artyom, would you be able to handle how to switch the streaming with Alex, please, while uh, we don't let our good friends wait too much and I start with the, the content? Is it a viable option? Okay. Yes. Great. Yes. Sorry. We are sorting it out. Of course, this is this was not planned. <laughs> Sorry for uh, the disturbance and thank you for being with us still. So let's move on. As you see, we are very much live. That's probably uncontroversial by now. We are live and uh, yeah, you're watching us on YouTube and we are supposed <laughs> to use Menti for uh, interactive quiz and we will hopefully resume that working uh, in a little while. Something that I haven't mentioned yet is that we also do have a Planet Cassandra Discord server, which you can reach by typing bang Discord in your uh, YouTube chat. And uh, these are the various ways you, you can reach us during the quiz. Actually, Discord is also, uh, Discord will be there even, we, even uh, after the workshop. So please join us on the server and let's keep the conversation going. Uh, okay, so more information on how to do these workshops with us today. The workshop is hosted, is a mini course hosted on the Datastax Academy, which uh, you will soon see, where you can also find today's slides and you can also find all uh, links and information to start the hands-on because I we mentioned already, today you're going to do all of what we are doing on screen yourself. And you have a chance to inspect the code and run it all without leaving your browser. That's not bad, right? Um, to do that, you will use an IDE, which is actually an IDE uh, in the cloud provided by Gitpod. So you, each one of you will just spawn their own machine and um, you will be able to, so it's a machine in the cloud that will work as a full uh, editor and virtual machine to run whatever you want in the browser. You will see it soon at work. It's astonishing if you haven't seen Gitpod yet. Uh, other, other very useful, uh, so another important tool we are going to use today is uh, AstraDB, which is a database in the cloud, which actually is much more than just a database, but today we're going to use it as a database. And it will be, um, well, we will soon show you how to create your own free database there and use it to store uh, some important bits uh, that will be used by the model. Artyom, may I ask you to be mindful of uh, typing noises, please? Sorry. I... Uh, actually, oh, okay. that would be Alex. Not Alex, me, can I ask you to be... I can't mute it now. Sorry. 
Uh, yeah, could you please mute yourself, Alex? Thank you. Okay, so uh, yeah. as you yeah. see, we are working hard behind the scenes to, to somehow rescue this streaming uh, craziness. Thank you, Alex. Of course, <laughs> we will later communicate secretly on the channel to figure out how to exactly to handle the takeover. But in the meantime, we don't want to let our audience uh, wait. So I just mentioned that uh, this content is, well, a heavily modified version, but it comes from the original content by Coding Entrepreneurs, which are, uh, are some of our partners in, and they have built the core of today's uh, AI content. So you are invited to go to the YouTube, uh, to their YouTube and their blog to learn more because they do a very more, they do something that would not fit into ours. So if you want to learn more, more details, a bit, a few mo more moving parts connected, that's where you should go. On the other hand, we added something unique and you will see soon. Okay, so uh, let me go to something more uh, to the point. What do we want to reach today? What, what is the goal of today's exercise? We basically want an API that solves a natural language processing problem. In particular, that's a prototypical example, we want to build an API that is able to distinguish spam messages from legitimate regular messages. And this API might be used by users, might be embedded into a broader application, whatever. So this is not our, our concern today. We just want to build an API. And this API will be seen just as a HTTP set of endpoints, of course, but internally it will wrap and expose a machine learning model that we have to build and train today. So that's uh, a broad view. More, uh, more to the point. And uh, to, to, to uh, elaborate a bit on this idea, the traditional point of view, uh, let's say, forget about machine learning for a second. We just have an API that will use some tools to work, some libraries, some ready-made pieces of code, whatever, some algorithm that it just embeds and uses. And one of them is the AI, which look, if you look at it from the API perspective, it will be wrapped as a black box. So a library, you embed, you, 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 the, the API code grabs this code and uses it to do internal function calls, and it will just expose the behavior of this black box outside to whatever issues an HTTP call. And that's, let's say, that's the le API level is the stuff for this serious guy you see in, in the slides. So an engineer which is careful about having stable, robust, well-structured code and whatever comes with that. So engineering stuff, right? Uh, to make it a bit of a mock, a fun story, the other half of the story is the machine learning. Now, I'm not saying that machine learning people are like these crazy scientists, of course, but it's a bit more a science on that side because it is a lot of you know, experimenting, trying several things, and machine learning practitioners sometimes, yeah, are more a bit like scientists, you know? Uh, that has, now I'm half joking, but only half, because I've seen my fair share of, of uh, messy things in machine learning. Sometimes, you know, people who do machine learning are a bit less concerned with reproducibility, with orderly structure of the program. They like to, yeah, they end up having messy stuff, maybe sometimes hidden in a repo, who knows where. So reproducibility is not always a very, a very core tenet of the data science machine learning uh, camp. Today we try to sort of uh, combine the two and we, we try to do the, f the full end-to-end -end journey, right? So we will have to wear the math scientist and the engineering hats in different times today, like this. So we have to do two in one, right? And as I mentioned earlier, uh, properly exposing, properly exposing machine learning elements in production is a very important uh, skill. That's crucial. That's where most of the machine learning projects uh, 
crash and fail before seeing the light of production. But still, it will be, well, I'm saying, I'm oversimplifying. I'm, I'm saying this will be two separate phases. So create the classifier and bring it to production. The reality is a bit more intertwined. So usually you have the next generation, uh, the next iteration of the machine learning model, and it's a bit more like a mutual interactive, mutual influencing kind of thing. But still there are two phases, there are two personas here at play, as we have uh, seen so far. Okay, so more to the point. Architecture. Uh, this will be uh, an HTTP REST uh, API, so there will be endpoints, and they are probably exposing something like you see in this sketch. So a request comes asking whether this particular sentence, this particular text is a spam, and it expects an answer probably on the lines of yes with this confidence, or probability of spam is 0 0.87, whatever. Internally, we want well, the API will be sitting on top of the model. The model is the machine learning component that is solving the, the hard problem, if, if you want. But there will be just there will be a bit more than that. There will be a database acting as a cache for predictions, for uh, spam assessments that have been run in the past. That's because in most cases we can imagine uh, running the machine learning model that is running a prediction might be. Uh, a slow task, like five seconds, because, well, that's not going to be the case today, but some of the machine learning tasks are, are really heavy. So since they are, since in this case, we are dealing with a deterministic model, there is no harm in caching. So if the very same message comes twice, we will just have to calculate it the first time, which in, 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 by the way, is not so unlikely because if we are thinking of SMS messages, uh, a spammer might spam many people so we will just store the assessment that this message is spam and use it over and over saving cpu time response time and whatnot so the api will first try to look in this database to see if the message is cached already and if so it will just return um, the, the assessment calculated earlier if not it will actually send it will send the text to the model, get an answer back, store it in the cache, and also re return it to the caller. So that's the general idea. Um, that is a uh, abstract architecture sketch. Let's uh, see what are the technologies which are uh, going to be used to implement this. So uh, the API as a whole will be run, it will be Python, it will be written in a fast API which is a modern framework for uh, running APIs in Python. <laughs> and it will be run by means of the Ubicorn um, utility, which implements the so-called ASGI Python interface for asynchronous uh, socket connections. So it will, in principle, support streaming connections, but that's marginal for us today, actually. Let's say fast API. The, the, the machine learning model will be a, a TensorFlow model, which in particular uses uh, Keras as its uh, backend. So it is, it is implemented on top of Keras, which are popular libraries at two separate layers, but they are popular Python uh, machine learning libraries, very popular, probably the most, the, the most used stack ever. We, uh, the database will be AstraDB. We mentioned that already, and uh, there will be more on that in a little while. And to, to speak to the database, to read and write uh, on the database, we will use the drivers uh, provided by, so the Cassandra drivers, because AstroDB is a database built on top of Cassandra. And uh, we will use the drivers, and in particular, the Python drivers, of course, and in particular, we will use the object mapper uh, paradigm for uh, interacting with tables in, and objects in a database. Okay, so uh, I think at this point, it should be a good point to, uh, so we are going to look a bit more in detail at how uh, this AstroDB database, basically Cassandra works and how it is structured. And I think it's a good time to uh, ask you, to beg you for a little more uh, patience because we have to figure out what to do with my very unfortunate computer that has frozen halfway
through. Um, okay, so the sad news is that I have to. I probably have to reboot my system, Artyom, because I, I. Let me try if I manage to get to the. See, I cannot even. How do you go to the. There is no way to go to the task manager. Um, I have no sympathy nor familiarity with Windows, but I think I have no way to get to it. That's Windows fault. Yeah, it Oops. might be. Okay, so I will just have to reboot my, win my, my Windows, I think. Uh, I see no other way at this point which is very sad. I will try to be back. We will try to be back in five minutes. I don't see any other way. Artyom, what do you think? Uh, yes, unless, yeah, I think it's... You know what you can do? You know what you can do? You, you, can, do, do you can ask the questions of Menti in the chat to just make up for the lost time, right? That's a good way. I'll okay. be back. And keep an eye on the channel because you will have to rejoin the, the Skype call. Sorry. So let me do the hard thing. Yes. Goodbye. Hope I'll be back soon. Yeah. Just please stay with us for five more minutes. Task manager. Okay, I might have solved the problem. I can you are we still good? Oh, we are still good. We are okay. still on YouTube. Okay, so I yes. I might have made a magic trick. So we are good. <laughs> Sorry, that was of course unplanned, but um, even unexpected. You know, I just came back <laughs> for some reason. My machine has gotten out of this deadlock by itself. That's great. Artyom, that's your turn. Please, database setup. I'm happy to give okay. it over to you and uh, breathe a bit. <laughs> yeah, you see, sometimes IT is uh, surprising. I'm switching to your screen uh, for yes, the slides first. So you, you are, your screen is showing. Okay, so the next thing we are going to talk about uh, database setup. Remember, we are going to use database to cache uh, our predictions, and also we will store um, the log of all the inputs that we are sending to um, to our machine uh, learning model. So we're going to use Apache Cassandra. Uh, Apache Cassandra is open source database, essentially. It's no, no SQL database, it's distributed database, it's used for uh, very large data sets, it works on, on a cluster of machines, and um, it's known for linear scalability, uh, very high uh, availability, um, and, and uh, very good read and write performance. So it's also um, sometimes called uh, white column, uh, or tabular NoSQL database. So it's b based on its uh, data model. But it, it also can be used as key value, um, and there are ways to use it even as document database um, through Stargate. We are not going to use the open source one because it's going to take time to install everything and, and deploy a cluster, uh, especially on GitHub. It, there are not so many resources, but we are going to use a cloud service database service called uh, AstraDB. And uh, it is uh, based on Apache Cassandra. It runs a cluster of Cassandra nodes behind the scenes. And um, one, once you create your database, there will be three nodes there uh, for you, but you, they are not going to be visible to you. And um, most importantly, um, th this database is serverless. 
So it's going to scale up and scale down automatically for you. So if you have a lot of requests coming, you will, for example, get a force node, FIPS node automatically and all of that. And um, it has a lot of uh, uh, capabilities that we are not going to use most of them, but I will just mention uh, several of them. Uh, so we are going to use, for example, CQL, Cassandra Query Language. We'll, we'll query our data in this database just to see what, what kind of request was, what kind of caching did we do. But uh, the, the, the database also supports uh, GraphQL API, Document API, REST API, uh, and gRPC API. Uh, besides the Astra DB, here we have the, uh, the, the, the Astra platform itself has uh, uh, other tools. It has uh, um, streaming, uh, and that one is built based on Pulsar. I'm not going to talk about it. It's a little bit out of scope at the moment, uh, but we will deploy this database uh, soon on Google Cloud. It's, it's going to be free. So how are we going to use um, database for this uh, system that we are building, which is going to have machine learning component, API com component, and database? So essentially, the, there are a couple of assumptions that we have. Uh, most of the time, uh, the, the machine learning model is deterministic, so uh, each time you get, if, if you give the same input to, to your model, it will give you the same output. So it doesn't make sense to recompute that output multiple times if it's expensive and just store it and cache it in a database. And especially if you think about, we're building spam classifier, right? Text classifier, which classifies whether something is message is spam or not. So in that case, you can imagine there will be many, many messages that uh, that are the same. The spam messages will be the same sent to different uh, accounts, uh, different phone numbers, and all of that. So it makes a lot of sense to just reuse that um, cached uh, uh, prediction, whether it's spam or not, rather than just recompute it each time. And especially if you think about the machine learning is usually the model is usually more expensive, so it definitely usually doesn't usually take a few milliseconds like a database. The response from a database can be single digit milliseconds. The response from machine learning model can be uh, dozens, hundreds, most likely hundreds or uh, even hundreds of milliseconds or even sometimes seconds, right? Depending on the complexity. And it's harder to scale than database which is already serverless, it auto scales for you. So indeed, this caching is going to be very important. So this is how it's going to wor work. Uh, uh, whenever we have a new prediction, we will save it, store it into the database. And uh, whenever uh, we have input for our API, the API, the, the, the system is going to check whether that prediction exists or not. And, and if it exists, it will just use that uh, prediction from the cache. Besides the predictions, we will also store um, call log. Essentially, we, we can store all the inputs that we are getting al along with the caller, uh, some kind of identification, maybe IP address. And that will allow us to um, uh, possibly analyze some of the callers and block them uh, or maybe in some cases, we can just uh, restrict access or, or uh, basically uh, throttle that, that access will not allow too many messages from the account. In the database, we will create two tables. We will not have to create them manually, but uh, um, uh, th there will be two tables, and one will be for cache items, spam cache items, and the other one will be for uh, the call log. So it, it's the, the second one is called spam calls per caller. So in the first table, you can see uh, there will be a model version, and we are going to have version one. We will build it today. And then um, there will be in, input, which is uh, a message itself. And two of these values will form a, a so-called uh, partition key, but also a primary key. So it, they will uniquely identify the row in this table. So we will have uh, other columns, other fields, confidence, which is 
could be 96 percent confidence that this is a spam the result itself spam or ham uh, and uh, the time uad which will uh, have we can always extract the timestamp from it so we will know when exactly it was stored um, uh, the, this this cache prediction and there is also a prediction map but it's it's basically just uh, again uh, the same information uh, in JSON format for, for the confidence and result. A little bit more extended, but you will see later. So this is a very simple table. Looks pretty much like a relational database table, even so it's not. But this partition key allows us to distribute data uh, in the cluster automatically and, and um, it and transparently. You don't need to do anything about that. Uh, the second table is a little bit more complex. You can see there are two things that are marked as K, which is partition key, and an, another column marked as C, which is clustering key. So essentially, there will be a partition for each caller, each hour, and within that partition, there will be multiple rows. So there will be multiple rows stored together in one partition for the for a particular caller and a particular hour. And um, simply, there will be um, uh, again, co uh, called add is a time UID, which is um, UUID based on timestamp. It can and and uh, timestamp will be used in this case for retrieving data, for sorting data, and all of that. And there will be uh, the actual message that the caller sent. So we're not gonna uh, spend too much time on on um, uh, tables here on data modeling part. But if you're interested in two weeks, we have a workshop called um, Introduction to uh, Cassandra. And there, there will be some live chat on what is partition key, what is clustering key, what is primary key, how they interact with each other, and so on. Okay. So we are not going to create these tables because they will be created automatically for us. We're using Cassandra driver. And, and we're using object mapper. And in this case, we, we're simply defining uh, how the, the, um, the, the, for example, this class spam call item will look like. It will have the uh, table name. Uh, it, will, it will map to a specific, this object will map to a specific table name, key space. Uh, uh, it, there will be column uh, caller ID, column co uh, called hour, called add, and so on. So essentially, uh, we, s we start with an empty database and uh, the tables will be created for us whenever we need to start using caching. And this will be a little bit later in, in our presentation. But at this point, we will just do the first lab, which is simply create this uh, database uh, with name workshops and uh, uh, key space uh, spam classifier. So I'm going to uh, switch to... I will switch you to demo mode there. So okay. our friends there will have more space to see what's going on. So we bear, bear the fact that we are a bit smaller, but you should be, it should be easier to see all of it. Okay. <laughs> so, so you can go to GitHub and there will be a link um, to the uh, Data Stacks Academy. This is something new we're using first time it for this workshop. But um, essentially, you can go to datastacks.academy instead right away, and you will need to create an account account here. Uh, that that would be the first step um, to be able to see all the instructions that we need to follow to create our database. So. Instead of creating an account, you probably already have Google account, so you can just log in using your Google account. And that's important. So I will wait here for a little bit because without, uh, without logging into the system, you will not be able to see the, all the instructions and you will not be able to participate and, and, and get a badge for this workshop. So again, datastacks.academy. Create an account, or even better, just use your Google account to log in. 
Okay, can you give me times up if you if you already in? Okay. So yes, as I mentioned, the academy is uh, the starting point for the full course, including resources, directions to start the hands-on, and everything. So that's very important. And I think yeah, I just posted, I just had the Nightbot post the link to the Academy in, uh, in the chat. We, we are getting a lot of confirmation. That's great. So which okay. is good. So once you log in, okay, once you log in, you will see either a specific course or just click all courses and, and you will get to this screen workshops and short courses is what we're going to do and we're going to do this first one which is ai as an api okay again all courses workshops and short courses ai as an api or once you are logged in uh, the link you see in the youtube chat should bring you directly to that one uh, course yes And this is the course itself. Yeah. Okay. So the first thing you, you will do here is just enroll me in this course and click enroll me at the bottom. Enroll me in this course. And again, I will just do it again. All courses, select this specific course and enroll me in this course and enroll me. Okay, now we are ready. We can always, you can always go back to my courses and find this course easily. Okay. And um, so what do we have here? The, our, so there is description of the course, a lot of uh, uh, resources that, that you may read through at a later time, uh, but uh, we are currently on this section, create a database in AstroDB, and it's going to be a pretty easy task for us. Uh, we will use this link, create AstroDB, uh, link uh, for this button, and we will create database with name workshops and uh, spam classifier as a key space. So database can have multiple key spaces, and, and basically the key space will contain all our tables, all our indexes, if any, all our material, materialized views, if any, so it contains schema, okay? Let's start, just click on the create AstroDB. You should get a new window. And if you, um, so if, if you never, used AstroDB before, you may have to sign, sign up. Uh, it's free, the, the, so there will be, you will not be asked about credit card or anything else. So it's a, it's a, you have a large amount uh, of uh, um, operations, reads and writes you can do uh, for free and, and, and that balance renewed every month. So I'm going to log in, sign in with uh, my Google account. Okay, I'm gonna switch to, so currently I don't have any, any databases in this account. Okay. Currently you don't have any, we, I don't have any databases. So are you on the same page with me? Were you able to get into Astra? Please. Thumbs up if, you, ah, see. if you're in. Okay, okay. Good, good. Arun, I'm giving you everyone. directions. So you just, you should go to the course content by clicking on it. And if you scroll a bit down, uh, there is a create a database in AstraDB section with an orange button, create AstraDB. Yeah, so you can here, once you logged in, you can click home, you can click databases. Uh, there is nothing right now, you can cre click on create database. If you're on the home screen, 
you can click here create database and with the same effect and uh, remember the name of the database this is important that you use the same name and uh, of the database and key space because we use that name in the code and you will be able to connect to that specific database and how you connect we will talk about shortly so it's going to be workshops the name of the database and the name of the key space is going to be spam classifier i have put them in the chat but i'll write them again so database name And we are going to deploy this database, which will be a, a cluster running for us. And uh, we will deploy it on Google Cloud. There are no other options for free account. I'm using free account just like you are. So um, only Google Cloud has unlocked regions for to use for free. And you can select either US East one or you can use Asia South one or Europe West one, depending on your location. So in my case, I'm gonna use US East one. Okay, it's pretty simple. And I'm gonna click on create database and uh, I'm almost done with the this first lab. And then we're gonna uh, focus on more on machine learning component. So, um, while the database is being created, what I want to do is to generate a token. So later I will I want to access this database and uh, to be able to connect to this database, I will need to have a um, so-called token for authentication and I can go through this generate token button. So it's under connect generate token, but um, this this first token that is generated, auto-generated for me, is not something that I want to use, actually. So I will close it and do nothing. And I will instead create a custom token. Okay. Create a custom token. And there will be new tab opened. And here I will select a role that this token will be associated with. I will select database administrator. And now I can generate token that will be suitable for our tasks because we will be creating tables in the database, right? So we will need a little bit more access than um, access permissions and the auto generated one. Okay. So download this token because uh, this page is going to expire or um, what you will need you don't need the first two client id client second you don't need them but uh, you can copy token and save it somewhere else this is what i'm gonna do i will copy and save it somewhere else and uh, this these tokens that you are generating um, do not expose them, do not share it, them with anyone else because th th these are like passwords. And later after this workshop, I will remove my database, will, re will remove my tokens and all of that. So which role, again, we have a question, the role is database administrator. So maybe we can wait one minute to make sure everyone uh, goes through the token generation. In the meantime, uh, Arun, you should see client ID. I but will also below that you should see client secret and also something called token that start with Astra CS and is a very long string of, of uh, characters. Yes, this yeah. the, this token so you should see. There were yeah. So make sure the token has the role uh, database administrator. Make sure you copy it because you will not see it again, <laughs> and uh, maybe you. Artyom, could you probably show once more from how to go to the token gen Okay, copy it, copy yours, of course, somewhere, but then, yeah. okay, then maybe you can yeah, go I did, I did. back so to the database let, let list to make to... sure, for example, AM is asking about steps for token generation. Um, okay, just just for general a general point, 
Uh, we will try to have every one of you follow along with us today live because that's the main goal. But in case you prefer to just watch or somehow something is taking longer than you think, than you expect or whatever, don't worry because all instructions down to the latest comma are written in the course. So you will absolutely be able to do the course, the workshop yourself at your pace, reach us on Discord, ask us whatever. So don't be, don't be worried if you, for some reason, prefer to do it slower and taking more time to see and to understand what's going on. So that's my point. Don't be uh, sad okay. if you want to go back to the course and do it again very at your, at your pace. Yeah, let me quickly show again. So once you created your database through this Create Database button, so I already have mine, which is active. So it's initialized. Uh, it has ID, everything. So if you click here on databases, right, you, you can, you will get this screen, your workshops database here. There may be other databases if you used AstraDB before, but one, one way to generate a token is, is to go from here. The other way is you just directly click here on workshops and then you can um, uh, go through connect and here create a custom token. That's what we did the first time, right? So create a custom token. If you have, if you don't have a custom token there, then the first one that is auto generated, you should ignore it and then create a custom yeah. token. Um, okay. So if I go through databases and do the, the generated token, I get to the screen. If I go to um, workshops, go to connect and create a custom token, I get to the same screen, but in a different tab. Okay. And here you will select database administrator and click generate. So I guess during this time, your database is has been not only created, but is active and ready to be used. That's probably. And even it if it's initializing, uh, we, we see a couple of the comments there that it's initializing. That's OK. Yeah. You can still uh, generate Just a remark topic. before we move on. Um, Kevin and maybe someone else who already had a workshop database and, and rightfully so created just a new uh, key space, you just make sure your database is um, resumed. So there is a nice button resume next to your database. Make sure it will be active again before the next parts of the hands-on. That's of course. Otherwise you will have uh, uh, still a hibernated database. That's because free tier uh, accounts sometimes get hibernated after long inactivity. Um, that's very, yeah. in a few minutes, they will come, come out, and the go back online. Yeah. To add to add a new key space, you can go to your databases workshops and click here at add key space. And you can create a key space spam classifier. I already have one, so I don't need to create a new one. But in case I need another key space, I can do that. Which this is add just key a space handful button. of seconds to, to be done. So no problem. Yes. Yes. Okay. So oh, as I said, Alex also remarked all detailed instructions to handle database and tokens are uh, explained and linked further in the academy. So probably we can resume the, so, yeah. okay. We did the first part of the hands-on. I think it's time I will switch to slide mode and to my slides again. So your database is there created probably some, some of your databases are still initializing. They will be ready on time. Make sure you have your token and let's change topic for a little while before connecting all points together. Let's speak of AI. Okay, so uh, first <laughs> let, let us set uh, uh, the expectations. Uh, this section is not um, a full course packed with uh, spiky mathematics on machine learning principles and derivations and details. You will not learn everything there is to, to learn about machine learning. But, uh, I, oh yes, David noticed that. I usually ask 
who in the audience is able to identify this guy. And I see we have a winner. Hi, David. Nice to see you are here. <laughs> How are you doing? OK, so uh, as I said, I, 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 the goal is not to, 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 for this to be a full uh, machine learning course, but I hope uh, at least a, a first uh, acquaintance with the topic will be gained today. So at least I, I would like you to know what is the meaning of this cryptic sentence, ML, LSTM, RNN for NLP. Uh, OK, so let's go, let's go back to the point. What we want is, in very abstract terms, a machine that accepts st sentences as input and returns probabilities of that being spam or ham. Ham as in not spam. So what, what is, oh, Ash, congratulations. You also won Feynman, Richard Feynman. OK, so back to, back to the topic. Uh, you know, there is not even a very precise definition of machine learning. It's one of those concepts that are a bit fuzzy at the border. So machine learning, uh, you can say that machine learning is a set of algorithms that improve by consuming and being fed data. And to some extent, they do not need to be explicitly told what to do to achieve that goal. Uh, from a statistical standpoint, machine learning is a very powerful form of statistical inference. So using known points to build a statistical model ready to be applied to new points, to new val input values. Uh, well, these are all just uh, definitions. Of course, behind the scenes, there is a lot of mathematics involved between so linear algebra to calculus, probability to statistics, and more. Luckily for us, uh, today the field is mature enough for almost anyone, any developer, to grab ready-made packaged tools and use them for their goals. So there is, yeah, David, I agree, very nice autobiography. <laughs> so uh, you don't need to be like a genius of mathematics uh, to do something relevant in machine learning today. It, it used not to be the case, but today is more and more so. Um, but back to, back to data analysis. Uh, if you ever did like a quadratic fit to a function, to data points to, to build a function, like in this first picture, or if, or if you did a logistic regression analysis on a binary uh, variable, well, you, you did some machine learning already because that's exactly the point. Um, that's an operation where you try to adjust parameters of your model to best reproduce known values. That's machine learning. But of course, when you say machine learning, in most cases, what you have in mind is something a bit more uh, unusual, if you ever, uh, let's say, a bit more involved than a, a functional fit. So there are all sorts of machine learning uh, problems and approaches and, and operations. Today, we will uh, concentrate on supervised learning. Mm. To just to mention, when, you, when we say unsupervised learning, we mean a machine learning task where the goal is to, where, where, the, where there is no need to show the machine fully uh, executed examples before it starts doing the, the, the it start learning. So for example, if we want a machine that generates paintings, or we want a machine that uh, finds the relevant features of a, of a bunch of objects. That's unsupervised. The machine will just do its whatever it, it is done. And yeah, there is no labeled data. When we speak about supervised learning instead, we have, a, uh, we have some examples of what the machine should do. We show them to the machine, it learns, and it will be able to do the same on new inputs which is our case, right? So we imagine we have, uh, somehow we get our hands on a few thousands of SMS text and, a, and the status of them being ham or spam. This is a label data. So not only we have a bunch of text, but we have labels, spam, spam, ham, ham, spam. That's a bit like here you see in these small black boxes. We have a set of sentences and below, and besides that we have ham, ham, spam, ham, so we have a labels, we have labels maybe made by humans probably, and that's a labeled uh, 
data set that we will use to train. Uh, what is training? <laughs> we will come back to this question a few times. Sorry. Uh, yes. Stefana, it's also important that the, this two, uh, the label training data is that are, they are denoted yes. as X and Y. That's something in the code, you will see uh, in good practice. Yes. In, in, That's in pretty the much yes. a standard practice to call these two things X and Y. As in, the machine is supposed to eat X and return Y. But this is so far the training data. So this is an input to make the machine good enough at doing it itself. What does it mean? Um, the machine learning models have a lot of different, might have a lot of different details in their architecture, how they are built and whatnot. So the, 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 the shape of the machine learning, whatever model will need to be tuned. Not only that, but once that is decided, uh, there will be a lot of, a lot, usually very much, very many small numbers here and there that determine how this, mach this machine learning model works. These numbers, will start, let's say, random or all zeros or all zeros, maybe it makes little sense, but they will start with no knowledge. I'll do a lot of air quotes today. They will start with zero knowledge of the problem they have to solve. But then we start somehow showing them the labels, the, 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 the label set and something called training happens. Training is the transition from the blank slate model you see on the left to something that it has learned what the problem we want it to solve, and we will be ready to work on new inputs. So it will finally be ready to give a new spam ham assessment on a newly on a new sentence it hasn't seen before. And indeed, the training is exactly the process of tweaking all of these numbers so that the machine learning model is more and more good, is better and better at uh, giving the right answers at least to the label case, to the label set, which we know. So that's training. Uh, we will see a bit more of it in a second. But of course, you, you, there are very many different algorithms and, and approaches to machine learning and many different problems and many different ways to solve these problems. Today, we focus on neural networks. Now, you probably have heard that neural networks are uh, modeled after the human brain. That's broadly true, uh, more or less the same as I read somewhere that the same extent you can say that airplanes are built uh, after birds, maybe. So the general idea, yes, it's inspired by the human brain, but that's a broad, uh, that's a weak analogy in a sense, because then it's just a particular algorithm and that's it. How is this algorithm structured? Well, um, we have simulated neurons, which are these uh, orange, light orange dots in this picture. Each neuron will receive several signals from other neurons, will do a particular computation and will, it will decide according to this computation, what kind of output to, to send to other neurons. And there will be, in general, very many of them. Uh, in easy architectures of neural networks, there will be layers, as you see here. Here, in, in, there are three layers depicted, and they will be placed in an orderly way. So the signal will always flow from one layer to the next. So from the first layer all the way to the last one. Of course, the first layer, we can call it input layer, because that's where basically we encode the, the X of the problem. Then this progressive propagation of signal modulated by the particular parameters of each neuron will happen. And these are just numerical values flowing in the network until we get to specific signal in the output layer. And they will be the Y. They, we will be able to interpret them as the Y. Now, uh, if you ever heard the, send, the, the expression deep neural networks, those are the networks with hidden layers. So not only input and output, but possibly many layers in between. And that's something that uh, boosts the capabilities of the network. Now, a single neuron, as I said, you can see it on a scheme of it, a sketch of it on the right. It is uh, a function that accepts a, a, a 
several numerical values as, as input. Basically, it does the sum, applies a function, and decides on based on this which kind of number to spit out to next neurons. Um, so just as a remark, let's say you have uh, man, so you have a many to many connections to, thanks to these uh, arrows you see in the, in, the, in the sketch and you have many neurons. Each neuron has as many numbers to tune as there are arrows in it going into it and maybe possibly a bit more. So you can imagine that the space of number, the, the, num the amount of knobs to tweak in the training is very huge in general, especially because many neural networks are, are big, are made by many neurons. And even though they do not necessarily speak all to all, there are still a lot of numbers here. So this is the general idea of neural networks. Um, now let's, let's do a step further. What you have seen so far is what is called the feed forward network, which means, as I mentioned, there are layers. So there are neatly defined layers and each one brings the signal over to the next one. And that's how the signal travels through the network. It's a bit like a dish of lasagna you see here. So um, it's easier, more orderly than the very most general case, because the general case will have arrows from every neuron to every other neuron. A bit like uh, the, the second picture. You see there are uh, tagliatelle here and they are all tangled in all possible ways. And the signal does every kind of itinerary in, in your dish. Um, but there's a reason why one should make their life harder by choosing this more general architecture. As soon as the signal is able to travel in loops, then something new happens in the network, namely the ability to show some kind of memory. Because once the neural network has a signal that falls over itself in a loop, then some neurons will be able to keep reminding other neurons or themselves of something that has happened in the past. So you can, that's of course not a very rigorous uh, statement, but you can think of loops as being what encodes memory of the past in the network, which makes these kind of recurrent networks better suited for tasks having to do with time series uh, sequences like speech recognition or handwriting recognition or text, right? Figuring out what is the meaning of a long text. That's something that works best if you have memory of what you've seen until now, right? Now there are uh, technical problems uh, with training recurrent networks because, well, uh, in, basically when you do training, you start you climb the causal chain backwards. You start from the output and you want to go all the way in the belly of the network to tweak numbers so that the output has the best, uh, is, is, is best uh, reproduced, is best mimicking the expected output. So that somehow goes backward in, 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 in the, it, it climbs the arrows back, right? So for technical reasons, once you have loops, um, it might be that it usually happens that the relation between the output and the parameters, the weights in the belly of the network you have to tweak is so weak, so long that training takes forever. Like the, the, the actual impact of the training over on, on the numbers you have to tweak takes so long that it's effectively nothing happens ever. And that's called vanishing gradient problem. So very clever people came up with nice uh, solutions to that. So instead of actually having neurons with loops, they built individual neurons, so components that have memory themselves, but they are well better suited for training. So you still have this memory implemented as a as signal going in a loop, but training somehow does not suffer from this vanishing gradient technical problem anymore. And that's what works. So let's go forward. Because as I mentioned, um, recurrent networks with memory are very well suited for uh, natural language processing. And if you think about it, 
natural language processing is has a very broad scope of application. It can span all the way from translations to auto-completion, generation of text, chatbots. I think many of us now are aware of the existence of something called chatbots. Sentiment analysis, summarization of long text, uh, you name it, right? Auto-corrections, etc. That's because, well, a lot of data out there, a lot of value is hidden in unstructured text. So that's a problem that is worth a lot of money, right? And the point is that uh, this particular brand of recurrent networks called LSTM, which stands for Long Short Term Memory, is very good at this kind of language-related, text-related tasks. Of course, this is a field that, well, is evolving a lot, especially in after, let's say, in the last four or five years with the, with the advent of uh, transformer-based architectures. And, uh, well, these transformers uh, are basically the main ingredient of where we are now with this uh, chat GPT and GPT-4, which is uh, basically has landed. And this is, of course, an evolution, a further evolution uh, from today's architecture. But, you know, we can't... <laughs> We can't train a billion parameter, a, a trillion parameter model in the space of this workshop. So we, we will not have ChatGPT from scratch today in one hour, you know, but that's a good start. That's a good yeah, start. At least, at least not today. Okay. So uh, a bit more details to, to, to bridge the gap to what you will actually run later. Um, the neural network model is a machine that has numbers as input encoded as particular signals in the in the in the neurons but that these are numbers and it will output numbers as well so first step and that's even before the model proper first step would be to make the input sentence into a list of numbers that we do with a tokenizer you see it here as a as a sort of orange uh, pentagon for some reason um, well for some reason I made this slide so I just chose randomly a pentagon for some reason okay so we need something called a tokenizer a tokenizer is a very simple machine it's a part of pre-processing and this is just what we use to turn a sentence into numbers now it's there's a, a surprising fact um, we can limit the tokenizer to know a few hundreds of words and it will just be prepared to translate every one of these words it meets into a given number consistently and it will just neglect the other words and that's surprisingly effective still so even just a handful a few hundreds of words will be creating a model that is very good enough already uh, of course we do we have to take care of preparing the tokenizer with a representative sample of input text so it will learn uh, to, you, to, to focus on the important words. So once we have the tokenizer ready, and there are libraries ready to prepare a tokenizer without much effort, once we have the tokenizer ready, we will be able to translate every sentence into a list of numbers. Then just to make sure we have equal size input, we will pad with zeros. And that will be something that is ready to be encoded in the, in the neural network for running the prediction. So the, the assessment of spam or ham, which we usually call prediction. Okay, so for example, you see, I, I highlighted uh, one line in the XY. So there's a sentence and there is ham. And that will become, the sentence will become this uh, particular list of numbers. So the X set will be a list of lists after the tokenizer. And in the same fashion, we encode the ham spam assessment as a two column, zero one or one zero output. This is what we want the neural network to actually return. And we will interpret that as probability of, ham, of spam and probability of ham. Another thing we are going to do is we take the several thousands lines of uh, input test, input uh, label data, and we split that into a bigger train set and a slightly smaller test set. And we will take the care of never showing the train part 
to the model during train. Sorry, never showing the test part, never using the test part for training. It will be clear uh, in a little while. Okay, so um, I suggest we switch to actually starting the training. So preparing the data set on Gitpod, launching the training and why, while it runs, which takes maybe five or six minutes, while it runs, I have a couple of more slides on the training uh, process. So we best use our time. So Artyom, if you're okay, I will switch to uh, demo mode for you. Great, there we go. Yes, please. So we are back to our instructions on Datastax Academy. Datastax.academy. And uh, here, so what, what Stefano explained, we, we have this pulkinizer, we have to pad, we have to uh, split, we have to train. Uh, we will do all of that, but we, we are going to use uh, libraries for that. We're not going to do it, we're not going to write code to, to pad or to split. We, we're going to, you will see, we're going to use just Keras libraries and, and uh, uh, data frames and, and uh, some other things that, that we will be able to, to just call to pad, to, to split and all of that. Uh, we will use um, git pod. And again, there is a button here, you can just click it. So it's in start git pod section. Click on open git pod. And uh, there are instructions on how to do it. Uh, uh, you, you can always, if, if you missed something that I'm explaining, you can always go return to the instructions and, and look at them again. So what we will do here, we're gonna train train the model after we do the uh, after we start the git git port we're going to train the model i will work you through so you can follow uh, follow me and, and do the same things it's not going to be um, uh, difficult uh, and um, hopefully yeah so um, and, th and then then we're going to be able to prepare our data set and train the model so let's start with the git port itself it will take uh, a minute to load and well in your case in my case i already logged in into git pod it's again it's a free uh, platform to uh, that have has ide in this case and and has some resources infrastructure uh, to use so in your case you may have to use your github account to log in or sign up again it's free it's 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 not going to be um, it's very convenient to, tool if you haven't used it before. So once you start it, you get this screen, which looks like VS Code. There is File Explorer here. I will make it a little bit larger. There is File Explorer here, and we are going to use it and, and uh, open some things, and we'll be able to edit here. And this is the, the README file that you, you may have seen on GitHub, or you went to Academy directly. And uh, there are terminals, there are three of them, and these are navigation for these three terminals. Most of the time, by default, we're going to use in use work shell. Work shell and uh, for curl commands, we are going to use uh, curl shell and notebook shell is something we don't need to even use because there, there is a, a Jupyter notebook software running in, in that shell. We can stop it if we need to, we don't have to. Okay. So we are going to use most of the time work shell. Okay, so hopefully you're able to start git pod. If you go back to the uh, instructions, the next thing we will be training model. And uh, uh, there, there are, so we will first look at the data set, but there are two ways to train your model. And easy, easy or actually um, we'll inspect the data set first and then we'll be prepare data set. Remember, we will have to tokenize, convert our messages, text messages, sentences to words and then to numbers, map those words to numbers, and, and uh, we will have to pad and we'll have to split and all of that. So we will prepare data set next. And, and one easy way to do it is just to run this command. Okay, is there is a script which does all of that, uh, does the tokenizer, um, the the um, padding, um, 
one hot encoding for spam ham, which is essentially uh, zero and one for those two fields, and and uh, and and then split into training and te testing parts. Okay. Uh, the other way to do it is using Jupyter, so we can actually execute step by step and maybe see the output. We will probably use use this one step, and if it works, uh, that's great. Um, it's easier to make mistake if you use Jupyter, but we always can fall back to the just script. Okay, so back to Git pod. The first thing we want to take a look at is at the training folder here we have data set subfolder and there is a spam dash data set csv file and we have three fields uh, one is label ham or spam uh, the the next one is text the message and the last one is the source and and in this data set there are two sources one is coming from youtube Another one is just SMS messages, and uh, they are merged together, so we will be able to use both of them. And we really don't need the source field, so we will get rid of it. We just need the the message and label. Again, uh, so th this these are messages that we know 100% that that they are either ham or spam with basically 100% confidence. Uh, and we will use this data set for supervised uh, training. And and part of this data set will also be used for testing whether Just it's a, accurate a, or not. Just a short command, command. The source of this data set is listed in the, in the academy, in the course in the academy. So they come from a, a open collection of machine learning data sets. Actually, two of them merged together. The other question, sorry, Artyom, I, I, I would like to ask our friends here if they are uh, okay with the size of the text in Gitpod, as you see on, on the YouTube screen. Of course, you should crank the resolution to the maximum because, of course, there is a lot of text to be seen. But if you, if you want the, the, the font size to be a bit bigger, okay, so just let us know. Sorry, go ahead. Just making sure. Okay, great. Yes. Ah, yeah. Okay, so we will start with the next step, preparing the data set, and we will open Jupyter Notebook using this command. Okay. And note that the password will be a spam classifier to access the, the notebook, and the notebook that we will be using is prepare data set. So in your work shell, this is the command I copied. And the first time I'm copy pasting, I will have to say allow okay, copy pasting. So I will wait a second for you to be able to do the same thing. Yeah, so, okay. Yes, yeah, someone might benefit from a little zoom in on the font size, but up to you, so. Okay, yeah, uh, I guess I can go a little bit. Okay, hopefully this is better, but that's probably as big as I will get. Otherwise, everything will be, uh, we'll have to wrap on the, another line. Okay, so this is the command I used and check. So you will get a new tab opened. And if it didn't open, then check your pop-up uh, blocker if you have one. So here, I will use the uh, uh, password spam classifier, login, and uh, I'm getting to this uh, 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 notebook uh, software under notebooks folder. There is a prepare data set notebook that we are going to use. Okay. Again, under notebook, here our prepare data set. So I'm going to click it and it again opens in a new tab. So uh, 
In this notebook, we have a bunch of uh, cells. We will be executing them and seeing what happens. Some of these cells uh, we can uncomment and see the uh, what what's currently uh, in in that particular variable or what what is the length of sequence and so on. So you can see we're importing a bunch of things. We're going to work with. Uh, we'll use pandas, uh, numpy, JSON. Pickle is just a file format uh, we are going to use to store our intermediate results um, so that we can later load them in, in the next script, which is going to do tr uh, training. So, so Pickle is just serialization format, and it's specific to Python. And then for padding sequences, this is what we're going to use from Keras uh, library and Duckinizer as well. And, and then we're going to be converting something to categorical. You will see what, what it is. And then the, there is a little bit of uh, uh, scikit uh, to, to uh, split our data sets into train and tests and, and test data sets. OK, so just run to import. OK, you will get an error message. And that's uh, you can ignore it could not find the load this dynamic library. So that, that means basically that we're not going to use GPU, which we don't have anyway, I believe, on yeah. Git mode. So we don't have access to it. So here's our input file, the data set that you just saw. We are going to start with it. And the output file will be placed into the prepared data set folder. And it's going to be pickle format. So we will we will see what will be inside a little bit later. So let's start, define these variables. Uh, now we're going to read the file and we're using data frame here. We're reading the, this uh, uh, CSV file and uh, we're going to create lists of labels and lists of tags. And then uh, we do have this dictionary label agent, uh, ham0, spam1. We invert it. And then we also uh, have the something that is called labels as integers, right? Let's see. So let's execute it. And uh, let's look what, what we got out of that code. So in the next one, we can simply uncomment things, uh, those variables, and see what the output will be. So this is our tag. So th this is basically the array of, of uh, text messages. What about uh, label legend? Well, as expected, we just basically define it here and then um, invert. You can see it's now it maps from zero to ham, from one to spam, labels and labels as in. So labels these, so we have text separately from labels. And now labels as int, you can expect that we will have the same array, but with, with zero and ones, right? Yes. OK. So you can uh, explore those things um, separately and, and, and uh, make sure that, they, they, that you understand. Uh, I will probably not be, will not be able to go through all of them because um, some, some of the things, so we, we, we have uh, quite a few files here with um, dozens of lines of code, but just, uh, so the next one is tokenizer. So Stefano mentioned that we don't need to uh, uh, have infinite number uh, tokenize or map in infinite number of words. We, we, we can have a smaller number like 280, and that's going to capture most of the uh, language, most of the sentence. So that's so that's how many uh, words tokenizer will actually recognize and map to numbers, and everything else it will ignore. So these are most frequently used words. And again, this is a parameter that you may change, and things will change. Um, so we're going to tokenize this this text and and uh, convert to sequences. So let's do it, and let's see how our sequences look like. Oh, actually, yeah. Let's let's see how the sequences look like. Okay, so this is the uh, the text one text message encoded as numbers. But you can see some text messages have many numbers. Some have just uh, two numbers, and so on and so on. This one has 
um, a larger amount. So the next thing we need to do is to pad those sequences. And again, we are not inventing something here. We're just padding them to the size of 300. So if it's if any sequence is more than 300, then, then we're going to cut it. If it's less than 300, we're going to insert zeros. So let's do it. And we can now see. So lengths for sequences, where well, we can try that. OK. And now for x, Yeah, we have uh, this many sequences. So the, remember X on the slides, uh, that was our messages, right? That was denoted as, that was our input. And each one is 300 um, um, numbers, 300 numbers. So we can see what X looks like. Okay, so it's a multidimensional array, essentially. So each sequence is of equal size now, and they are padded with zeros. Okay, good. So switch to categorical. Okay, so let's take a look at. So this is essentially we are preparing our Y, and remember that Y is our uh, output. Okay, so an output is we said ham or spam, so it's going to be. Uh, so one valor is going to be for ham, another one will be for spam. So right now they are basically either one or zero, one or zero, right? Or zero or one. You cannot have zero, zero and one, one. Okay, so we did this. Now we're going to split data sets. And again, we are using available functionality for us. We're not, so we're going to have uh, input training, uh, input testing, um, uh, and also the, the, the Y component output training, output testing. Okay, done. And the, well, the shape will be pretty much, you can guess what it is. So we have the, uh, the training data set has 5,043 sequences and the test data set will have oh this is still training and the test uh, the test one will have um, fewer number 2485 uh, sequences that we're gonna be using to test okay and we are almost done so all of these that we created the x data set and for training for testing and y data set the the parameters for the sequencing and, and tokenizing and the tokenizer itself, we're going to temporarily save it into this file using this pickle uh, format. Okay, good. So at this point, we can go back to Gitpod and look at the prepared data set folder. So it is, there is a pickle file here, but it's not going to open for us. It's a binary, a binary format. So we cannot look into it. But the next step, the training step, is going to take that uh, data set, will load all the, that information, the, 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 the uh, data, the tokenizer, and all of that, and we'll be able to train the model. So I'm going to go back to instructions. In case if you didn't follow completely the Jupyter instructions that we just did to prepare a data set. Again, you can go back and copy this command with option B or without, without it, just run this prepare a data set um, uh, Python script. It is right here. You can take a look at it. So it's the same thing that we did in the Jupyter. So in, in, any, in case if you didn't finish and or something didn't work in Jupyter for you, you can always run this script to be able to generate this intermediate result. So the next step for the training is going to be quite simple. We are going to just use this uh, 
next script called train model. Okay, and um, what this script is going to do, it's gonna first load data from that pickle file from the previous step. Uh, it will create a model which will be a blank slate. So it's gonna be a neural network based on LSTM and uh, uh, with several certain parameters that we can always adjust to get different result. And, and then that network will be trained and we don't basically we just let it train itself based on that uh, training data set. And, and we don't really need to do much about that. And then at the end, the model will be saved along with tokenizer and uh, associated metadata. We still, we always want to keep the tokenizer again because we want to be able to, each input, each new input we get, we need to tokenize it first, right? It's, it's not just we training on numbers, but the, the input we get later needs to be converted to numbers again using the same, the same tokenizer. Okay, so this should be easy. We're gonna just do the, this Python train model uh, dot pi, but it's gonna take a little bit of time to to load because the the uh, so it, it it may take several minutes to uh, to train right. Uh, so we can while doing that we can briefly look at this uh, train model script, what it does. Okay, again, all of this. Uh, is done with the help of Keras. So um, a lot of things that 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 seem to be um, complex uh, are hidden by this high-level API. So we have this model, sequential. We have LSTM uh, for our layers and and bunch of other things. Okay, and um, so we get in the our input is the pickle file, and we will later store our model using eight h5 uh, format which is uh, um, specifically useful for for this this type of data uh, that that um, that that we store for machine learning so we, we are going to store JSON, uh, also json files for for the metadata and tokenizer and we will be able to look at them later how, how they look like. So what, what we're gonna do here is load the, load the pickle file, um, create our, again, data sets for training or testing X and Y data set, the input and output, and uh, uh, several other things for, uh, uh, such as tokenizer and, and uh, parameters that we use. And then we create the model Okay, so it's a sequential model with different parameters and eventually we, with LSTM uh, the network that we want to use. Okay, and the training itself is this feed. So once we have these uh, models uh, uh, defined, the training itself will, will be um, a feed method for the, for the model that will take our data sets and and uh, we'll have certain other parameters like like the page size and number of epochs in this case we define three and you can see we are running so far we are running the first one okay and then at the end we just save in this model into uh, into a trained model file Okay, and saving metadata into JSON okay. and so on. Great. So you went all the way to running the training. That's great. I wonder. Yeah, I I would like to ask you a, a thumbs up if you are if you are running the training part, if you followed so far and are able now to see the output of the training which is running. That is taking a few minutes. Running, running. Thumbs up. Great. Nice to see that. So, Artyom, while we wait for the training to finish for most of our folks there, uh, I would like to steal the scene from you a few minutes. And I will switch back to 
my uh, screen. So you have the running uh, training. And now it's a good point. This is something that you have seen in the code because um, Artyom was very uh, detailed. Uh, luckily, it showed everything. That's great. So you have seen that in the training code, the network is built. And it is built as a stack of layers. Each one is tasked with, let's say, a different task. The, the most interesting one is this LSTM layer. So as I, as I mentioned, this network, it has loops. So it has memory, so to speak, but it is still a rather, hand, uh, a rather easy to handle architecture because it is mostly a, a lasagna, but one of the layers internally is tagliatelle, right? Is this tangled mess, which makes it easier to train and still retains the memory thing. So this is the way, uh, this is the language this uh, TensorFlow primitives you use to, to actually build the architecture. Uh, we are not going into the details of how and why every layer is structured in this way. Let's say that we have two constraints. The first layer must be able, must have the shape of the input list of numbers we want to feed it. And the last layer is probably going to be a two number output summing to one. So the two probabilities. What happens in, in the middle is, yeah, the result of tuning and, but um, I, I want to make a remark. We, in this practice, in the part of the practice that has been run so far, um, a lot of time went into preparing the data set for training, more than running the training code. Of course, your, mm, so th th this, this might change case to case, but that's not even, that's very common. So a good part of uh, preparing a neural, uh, a, a machine learning model is in getting the data, cleaning the data, making it uniform, discarding the nulls, making sure it has always the same shape, checking that there are no anomalies in the data, maybe combining different data from two sources in which have the different formats. And you are lucky that today we have prepared a ready-made data set, a CSV that was perfect and square and rectangular and whatever. Real life might be even less so. <laughs> so be, be happy. Okay, so back to, back to um, what happens during training. The training is what in the code is this model.fit primitive that Artem was showing. And the inputs are mostly X and Y for the training, as you've seen. So it, it, this is like saying, hey, dear model, now I built you blank slate. Now tweak your very many parameters in the neural network so that the response, the prediction, when, you, when I give you X train will be as close as possible to the Y train labels I prepared for you. That's the meaning of, 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 the, of the training. And you, you see this picture again. Training is like tweaking the numbers hidden in the belly of the network until the prediction it creates is as close as possible to the labels I know from other sources. This is supervised learning, right? Uh, so first I need a way, a mathematically well-defined way to say what does it, what it means for the prediction to be close to the labels. So it turns out there are a few pretty standard definitions of this closeness of results. Okay, Taiwo, you are almost done. Great. I will still keep speaking in a couple of minutes. So then you will give, you will go back to uh, other things. But so uh, there are a few standard mathematical definitions of how to measure how close the predictions are to uh, the label, expected labels. And of course, training, you can see training as uh, a way to tweak these many parameters so as to reach the bottom of a valley. So we want the loss function, which measures this difference between predictions and labels. We want this loss function to be as small as possible. And to do that, the training progressively tries to change and change and change and change until it gets to the valley. That's not easy as in this first sketch because uh, this sketch is one dimensional. So there is one parameter in the drawing, but actually there are, even in this network you're running, there are uh, short of 300,000 parameters. 
So it's not easy to just change all, all of them by hand until, until you get the minimum uh, of the loss function, right? So there are specific techniques which are stochastic in nature because that would be too much to just explore the full space. So they have to do some dice throwing, some randomness in exploring different directions. And the, the very cool thing is that you don't have visibility over the, the whole mountain to locate the valley, the bottom of the valley. You just see around you. And to see around you, it's like you are in the... I, I read an analogy. You are on a mountain and there is fog. All you see is a few meters around you. And even to see that, you have to, to, to run to do computations. And then what do you do? You, you just follow the direction with the steepest downward slope all the time. That generally works. Sometimes you get, you get trapped in a, in a lake high in the mountains. So that works, but you need some randomness to make you jump over ridges sometimes. But more or less, these approach called stochastic gradient descent, coupled with a, a bit of uh, further mathematical optimizations, is what makes training possible. Uh, so there, are, there is an important caveat about training. Uh, I mentioned that we split training set and test set, and you see that you, you've seen this happening in, in, the, in the code, right? And the training was only fed X train, Y train. The test part has a different role. So let's say you are training over and over and over. You're training so much that your loss function is always decreasing, decreasing, decreasing. That might be not what you actually think, because there might be a point where the network, so to speak, stops learning what is spam and just learns to really give the right answer to those particular inputs you are feeding it. So it's not learning the, the real problem anymore. It's learning how to give the right answer to these 5000 inputs which is not what you want, because then it would not work well against a new input, right? This is a very known phenomenon. It's a danger in, in training machine learning models, and it's called overfitting. That's why you keep a, a separate test set that the model does not use for training, because then you can use the test set to make sure the model is still performing better and better with data, input data that it hasn't seen before. So you see, the healthy situation is the one in the bigger graph. As, as, as your training goes, the training loss function is decreasing, but also the test function, the test uh, values will give better and better performance. But if you, if you run into overfitting, then you see the training results go low and low. So you are getting closer and closer to the training labels, but the test is not decreasing anymore. It might even be increasing because you are not learning the problem anymore. So you have trained too much, so sort of. So that's the reason why uh, you, you split training and testing. You, you can even do more splitting, but that's a bit beyond scope. But the point is that you have to use an independent data source to uh, assess whether you're, you're not overfitting in this case. That's a very important practical point. And we are at chapter five of today. Uh, I suggest, Artem, we skip the secondary part and we, we remind you that on the academy, the full course has more things to try. I would probably uh, just skim over this part and, and give it back to you, Artem, to show uh, to show the, the production. So sure, very quickly, yes. your training yeah. has finished. So you have a model saved in a file ready to be used by the API. So let's speak again of the API very quickly so that you, you will later uh, make it run, right? So, well, uh, you will use fast API, which is a Python framework for running APIs. I'll just very quickly skim on, on, on this slide. It has, this project has a particular structure, the main points, the main entry point is main py, which defines entry points. So these are Python functions on one side, but they are attached to HTTP endpoints so that when the API runs, you will not have to do it yourself, but it will happen that when there is a request, 
this is parsed, the right function is chosen, and it will it is run with the right inputs, and the output of the, the return value of this function will be the response of the HTTP request. This is done by the a, a, API framework for you. So that's the, 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 the gist of using a, a, a API framework, of course. Uh, then there is a module for database input output. There is a module for uh, schema validation of the input parameters and so on. Of course, the important part is this AI model PY, which is a class that wraps the model and makes it into... So we have written a small class that contains the model and makes it it's access a bit friendlier. So instead of having to fit numbers, the class will just have a method that accepts a sentence, like a text, and it will return a properly structured output. But in, in the, at the core of it, there's the model. Uh, so doing this kind of wrapping is useful for various reasons, for usability, of course, in, in broader code basis, but also to better handle version different versions of the model, which might be different internally, but they will have to comply to a unified interface, so you can easily switch versions in the API and whatever other comes to mind. Um, this is a bit much more stuff. I would like to explain that to you, but you will have to see it in the Academy course. And I'm back to you, Artyom, for the last part of the practice where you actually run the API and test it, of course. Back to you. Yeah, so the last step, we finished training our model and done, done, done. I have model metadata uh, tokenizer. So that's what is going to go to that uh, uh, model um, uh, Python uh, uh, script that or class that, that uh, Stefana mentioned just uh, a few minutes ago. So what next? Uh, even before building the API, let's just quickly try whether what we did actually works or not. So here is the uh, load and test model script. We're going to just execute it. It's going to be quite simple. Okay. And this loads our model and uh, essentially what, because we didn't give any parameters, um, it takes two sample text and, and classifies them. Okay, so we are able to use this model to classify text. So this is the first one, it tells us this is a spam. This is the second one, it tells us is a spam, it is a spam again. Right. You can look at this load test model file. It's uh, again we we are basically loading all of that that we saved, uh, and, and what we saved for uh, once we trained the model, we saved the JSON file with metadata, JSON file with uh, uh, tokenize, also the H5 file, which is not going to be readable, but which is the, the model itself. Okay, and. Uh, so in load and test one, we are going to load all of that and we will be able to predict predict spam status using, using this uh, function, uh, which takes all of that plus text. And since we didn't pass any parameters, it's going to use these two sample text to, to basically um, uh, predict the spam status for them. Okay, so it, it's it's not too complex, but still, if you're interested, you can. It, it's still 55 lines, so it may maybe uh, may take a little bit time to go into more detail. So it works. We can even try to pass a parameter to pass our ca uh, custom message and get the result. Okay, but at this point, I would like to switch gears and go to explore an API and. Uh, we will use Fast API to build um, to expose this functionality of predictions to uh, external world. We we are HTTP uh, API. So, but first remember that our API has some additional functionality. It's going to use database as a cache. So we will need to uh, we will need this API to be able to connect to to the database. 
Uh, and we we already have the, uh, the if, if you look at the uh, back to Git pod, if you look at the API folder here, there are things that work with database. Uh, here is your AI model, which is again that model plus tokenize, uh, tokenizer plus uh, metadata. Um, uh, there, there, there are different things with uh, uh, database input output, like storing call uh, calls to um, log. So remember, we doing caching and we also doing logging and things like that. And there's uh, there are two two APIs, uh, mini main and main. So we're gonna first run mini main, then main. But before we, we are able, so the code is here for you written, but be, it will need to connect to database. So we will need to uh, provide the our token and some other things to be able to connect to the database. So the first step we will do is we will use Astra CLI, which is just command line tool that is able to work with Astra uh, uh, cloud service that, that we, created database with. Okay, so we're going to, again, uh, it's going to be important that you use work shell to run it. And what it will ask you is the token. Remember, we saved the token in, in the beginning. Uh, so I can just very quickly show you again how to generate a token uh, for AstraDB. You create a database, workshops, and key space spam classifier. Okay, and then uh, we were able to generate. Oh, sorry, not here. Connect. Generate the token, custom token for. database administrator. Okay. And this is a token that you saved somewhere. You either unloaded it or you copied it to a file. So I'm gonna use this new one since I'm already here. I'm gonna go back to the Git pod and copy paste that token. And I will have to destroy it because it's now exposed. Okay. So and this way we just set up the uh, the um, Astra CLI. So the next step, the Astra CLI, uh, we can work with our database. So this command simply uh, gets information about the work workshop database. So you can see what it out is is the name of the database, ID, status, where it's running, and what key space is it, is the we have there. So we have only one. So that's not why we're using Astra CLI here. Astra CLI is going to help us to generate a file with all the needed credentials to be able to, uh, for API to be able to access the database. So I'm going to use this command, which is create.env environment file for the key space spam classifier database workshops. Okay. So what happens after that? Very simple thing. This environment file created, and you can look at yours. I'm not gonna. Uh, so the yeah, I can probably show. That's it's fine. Um, so there are all different URLs that may be needed, and and uh, here is my token, and here's my other things. But I will have to um, delete again this information later. But this is not the end of it. We still need to create, add a few other things to this file. Okay, and uh, essentially we are pending information from this file, and this this file contains information uh, about the classifier itself, about the the uh, parameters and things like that. So if if you were not able to train your classifier, you can replace this mock model class to one, and you still can can play with your API. Even so, the classifier is not going to be 
uh, real machine learning classifier, it, it will, it's just more complex. If you mock the model, it will always say spam 100% or something like that. It's just for, for a functional test of the API. <laughs> So don't expect much intelligence, yeah. whether artificial or natural, from the mock. <laughs> OK, so now we have uh, our application is able to connect to database. It knows where the model is and all of that. And uh, we will expose it using uh, expose it, uh, uh, different methods as endpoints in the A API using uh, this uh, unicorn web server and uh, fa and fast API. Yeah, so uh, I will run it first, and then we'll we'll look at code very very briefly, uh, what it does, what to expect, right? So again, this is the under API has this uh, mini mini main application. Uh, Artyom, that, Artyom, sorry, maybe uh, we can skip the that... mini API and go to the real one. So we are go to the real one. Okay. Yeah, we so are the, the mini, running out just of for, time, for everyone. So the mini API is a simplified version of the actual API for uh, designed to show the basics of fast API without confusing other things. So it's really the minimum to 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 get the point of fast API. You are invited to look at it following the academy instructions by yourself if you're not familiar with fast API that is. But I think we are a bit short on time, so we might just go to the real thing, which should be just ready to run because we have the model, we have the end file with the secrets, yep. so you can just start it. Sorry, but uh, so we can focus a bit on, on the, the full thing, look at the database or whatever. Thanks. <laughs> of course, yes. So here we go. Uh, the unicorn is running that uh, expecting the, the, those API calls. Uh, what exactly those endpoints are, we can uh, you can find in the this main file. Um, so let's just look at a couple of them, maybe. Okay, so this app, which is created, exposed with fa fast API and uh, um, on event is 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 one of the decorators. So what happens on startup? Uh, is here, but here is one endpoint which will simply give us some parameters. Uh, here is another endpoint prediction which will we will give it text as input and we will get the prediction as a result. And um, another one is predictions, so we can give multiple texts. Okay, so we can actually try this, um, try using this and. Um, we are going to we are, we can, we can do it either using uh, so this one uh, using curl command or using swagger so let's run a couple of curl commands so you can you can see how it works so at this point switch to curl shell and uh, we can execute so this is that that first one endpoint which was simply slash and it gives us some parameters for for um, our classifier. And the second one is more interesting because we now are going to pass, we're using prediction endpoint and we're gonna pass some text, click click to win a free car, and we are going to get response and format it as JSON. Okay. So what we can see here is uh, yeah, so the the so it doesn't show the input, but this is the input, and uh, here is the prediction that it is 95% of uh, confidence that this is uh, spam. Okay. And so the last thing I would like to show you is the same, uh, instead of using curl, but how to use uh, Swagger, uh, Swagger to uh, actually do it, um, to use those endpoints. Okay. Start Swagger again. All the instructions are in the Data Stacks Academy. So here we have the prediction get post prediction post. We have the basic info. Let's that's one is easy. There is no any input. So let's try it out. Execute. So here are the parameters. Right. Here are the parameters. So we exposed this as HTTP um, REST uh, API. We're able to 
use it. How about prediction? Um, try it out. So, um, this is my text. And uh, there are a couple of parameters. Uh, e echo input, so maybe I can say true. And uh, skip cache false. So let, let me run it, the first one. So what's going to tell? It's going to tell that this is ham, uh, not spam. And the data is not coming from cache. But if I run it again, you can see that the uh, the data the response came from the uh, cache from from Astra database. Let's let's do a few more things. So multiple text, multiple text. So that's a different endpoint. Here I'm gonna. That's predictions endpoint. Try it out. Next, okay. So this uh, Swagger uh, UI is automatically provided by FastAPI. You don't write a line of code and you get this web interface for experimenting with an API, which uh, comes really for free, which is not bad. Yeah. So, and you can, yeah, you can see again, we have three text messages and we were able to get the predictions for them and they didn't come from cache, but if you, we execute it again, then you can see they came from cache, from database. And by the way, there is a parameter which can yeah. skip cache. If we say true, then our uh, responses again, Yes. not coming from cache. So even so, they are stored in database. And now the final part of this uh, demo, I'm going to go back to um, for, to DataStax uh, AstraDB. I will this time, so I still have my database. As this time, I'm going to use SQL console to connect and we will see those tables that, that we talked about earlier and where the, the data is coming from when it's cached, for example. So, um, so I'm going to use um, spam classifier as a key space, default key space. I'm going to uh, describe my tables. So I have two tables. We did not create them. Uh, they were created automatically by our application. And I'm going to select from, from uh, the, the first one, the and see what is cached there. So you can see this is our model version one. These are the inputs that we cached, and this is the confidence, and this is the prediction that on only one is spam, everything else is ham in our case. Um, this is the, um, the the time UAD when we started it. We can extract timestamp from this. And um, this is the prediction map, which is essentially, uh, again, ham or spam and different confidences. Okay. And uh, describe the schema of this table. Okay, these are the columns the, that we've seen earlier in slides and looks like SQL, but it, this is a, a SQL, Cassandra query language. And with that, I hope you got an idea what is going on there and you have this all the code available to you and you can play and explore further. Okay, great. So back Thank to you, you Artyom. Stuff. You managed to show a lot of stuff. I hope our friends here have, have been able to follow along and to run uh, their API because that was the main goal of today. Uh, of course, there is a lot more to be seen and uh, I invite you to check the code, 
because uh, there's a lot there to check the slides, to check the, the, the additional information in the Academy course and to connect with us on Discord if you have any question or just want to discuss uh, further things connected, related to this workshop. Um, okay, so maybe we might, I might just mention a few additional directions because this is, this has been an exercise, but it could evolve in many directions. There is a concept called feature stores, which is a kind of database specific usage of a database uh, tailored to machine learning uh, goals. There might be specific architectural facts to consider for machine learning applications. Even just what is the right database for a machine learning uh, user? Do I need a database? I've seen this question. Yes, you do for many reasons. Uh, maybe not for all applications, but you might need uh, various for various different, logically different reasons, you might really need a database. Today we, are, we have been using a database as a prediction store, which is uh, very important in some cases, because sometimes calculating a prediction might take five seconds, might be expensive, CPU time. And uh, if it's a deterministic model, having a store to keep them saved is crucial to save uh, to get to give a better service and to save some money and whatnot. Then um, maybe you're interested in um, how to handle model versioning or other things like how do I set this up on an actual server with my Nginx reverse proxy in front of it? Well, the cool thing is that we have solved, we have an answer to all these problems, to all these questions. So you are invited to check uh, the repo, or actually even more, I should have updated the slides, the academy course where you have pointers to other tutorials, other courses, other material appendixes, which uh, expound a bit more on all of these topics and more. So I think we have uh, reached the, the wrap up part of today. I promised, we promised you we would have come back to Cascada, which is this cool tool to to handle uh, time series in a very smart way, in a way uh, suited for ML uh, workloads. And this is an example. So uh, let's say, okay, what, what, do, what have we done with the database so far? We store predictions. Well, we also store actual usage of the API by users for billing, for rate limiting or whatever you want to imagine, but we store predictions and user history. And we probably also might extend it to store SMS messages and the sender. What is the sender of this message? So we might invent a further usage of this big machine. This application might be enriched with additional features. So let's say we have basically, if we store the sender, the time and the text and whether it's spam or not, we have a very cool view over a particular sender uh, phone number, what is their history of spam, not spam? So we have basically a event, a time series with events, spam or ham events over time. And guess what? This is exactly where Cascada would fit because that would make it possible with a very terse and short language to treat this time series in a way that can be then fed to additional machine learning models, for example, for predictive blocking of spammers before they, they start spamming too much, because we might train a new machine learning model to, to, to learn how to guess that this sender is about to start spamming a lot, and we can block it. We can offer a service in our API that is like, you see these robocall blockers. This is going to spam. Or we can even use that on the uh, call log in a similar way. So again, that's a time series and we can start optimizing billing uh, to the predicted pattern of usage of this service, this spam detection service by, by user by user with a machine learning preemptive operation. Or we can flag abuser of the service like spammers of our service or whatever. So there are actually, well, this is just one of the various way we can uh, imagine extended this, this, uh, this service. Actually, one of the links I 
you find on the academy is a full tutorial on versioning and actual integration with feature stores so there are as i said many directions you can start from at this point um i think even though we are a bit late i think we should really run the, the quiz artin what do you think Uh, yeah, good. I think we should. I'm sorry. Should I apologize. Yeah. We, we've been running a bit late. I apologize for those who had to drop on the hour mark. But uh, if you can make another five minutes, I invite you to join us on Mentimeter and I will start what is now a quiz. So you will. Sorry, go ahead. And Yeah, while you're preparing that, I was just gonna sort about that. Yes. Another approach to uh, filtering sp spam specifically could be uh, something like collaborative filtering. Like when you're using Gmail, for example, you can ma mark something uh, as spam or not. And, and that kind of information can actually help uh, the, the uh, classifier to ba basically using uh, um, fil uh, filtering that is provided by users. And if we do something like that, we can probably, uh, instead of using neural network, we can just use stream processing like, like Cascada to be able to uh, basically filter messages, do the aggregations, filtering, and all of that. OK, yeah. so we give a, a little more time for folks to join the quiz. Uh, maybe I can try these to switch to the other useful view while I, I type an answer to the chat. Uh, OK, sorry. I, OK, so I think we can start the quiz. So there will be a few questions mostly related to what you have seen today. And you should try to answer fast and also to answer correct to be among the winners. Um, just one thing, do not watch YouTube for the answer. Watch your own mobile or um, your Mentimeter tab because there might be, there, there is a slight delay on YouTube. So please be careful and we can start. There are six questions. So get ready, get your fingers fast and ready to answer. And answer fast to get more points. So today we have seen an example of what? Image recognition AI or supervised learning or maybe a random forest, uh, unsupervised learning or we have seen a ballet by Tchaikovsky. Yes, almost everyone got it right and supervised learning is the answer. So we, we fed the model a set of inputs and expected labels as output and we want the model to learn how to make that kind of assessment that's supervised learning okay so daniel peter and dragonite are in the first three positions but there are more questions to go so everything can happen and we can start with second question the text classifier model is trained within the API code. So it's in the API that we train it. Or is a fit forward neural network? Does it need perhaps no training? Is it designed to have memory? Or I can't tell you because it's classified. I usually put some music on. I forgot. So maybe I can make up for it now and tell me if the music is too loud. So the answer is it is designed to have memory. Unfortunately, it is not really a fit forward because it has these memory elements, which makes it for the memory indeed. Okay, so something has changed in the leaderboard and Peter, Zlatan and Dragonite. Zlatan jumps to second position and we can move to third question. Okay, so answer fast. Oh, okay. To train the model, we have called the train method, or we have called the fit method, optimize method, predict method, 
or we just set some properties in the model, or we have to write the full training algorithm from scratch. Ah, that was a bit hard. We called the fit method. Uh, Artyom was very uh, careful in showing that. There is a, a method called fit of the model that uh, has an in as input the x, y for the training set. Let me tell you that luckily we don't have to write the full training algorithms because it's quite uh, involved and it would take a few days to come up with the right equations and implement them in uh, code. So it, we are lucky that today there are ready to use libraries to handle that. Okay, so changes again, Dragonite, Luco Luco and Daniel. But I think everything can still happen. That's why we jump to the next question. Number four, we are halfway in the quiz. Okay, so we use a database. Ah, we just happened to discuss that at length. Very good. We use a database called Keras. We use a database, uh, actually we don't. We use a database called AstraDB. We use a database as a middle layer between the API and the model and the classifier. We use a database built on Cassandra. Choose the right answer or answers, I should say, because there are two right answers and most of you got it right. Congratulations. We use a database called AstraDB, which is a database in the cloud built on Cassandra, managed for you, so you don't have to take care of operations. and. This is where we store predictions and usage logs of the API. So almost everyone got it right. So yeah, but Daniel managed to jump to jump one position up. Congratulations. And we can jump to the next question. Almost there. Question number five out of six. But I'm happy to see that most of you got most answers right. So uh, we have you we have been using cassandra drivers object mapper which means that you can just not think about the table there is not even a table at all to speak of or does it still require a proper data model to choose so thinking carefully of the columns or the object mapper is an alternative to the nlp classifier ah that was hard Artin. what do you think <laughs> so uh yeah uh, object mapper is a way to access tables in Cassandra or in general when, when there's a database driver involved. But it's it would be very dangerous to think that this enables you to forget about the underlying table structure because there is a table underlying uh, uh, behind that. And if you get it wrong, you will still run into yeah. avoidable performance issues. And uh, sorry. Uh, I yeah, you, you still de defining Indeed. your Indeed. primary key yes. uh, explicitly. But yeah, you, you can think about it as just uh, yeah. objects in your uh, object-oriented program, uh, right? Uh, mapping yeah, to it, tables in uh, actually rows. Yeah, it, it, it's a different in, way in to handle reads and writes from a table, which you still have to consider. And don't get me started on my personal opinion on object mappers. By the way, the last answer is completely out because object mappers are not an alternative to the classifier. They just do a different thing. One thing is reading and writing from the DB. The other is, you know, giving a spam ham prediction over an input. So I think we are at the leaderboard before the last question. And yeah, I, I appreciate that was a pretty hard question and that has scrambled the leaderboard a bit. Luco Luco is first now and we get to the last question. Now it's all or nothing. Ready? Answer fast to get more points. Okay, what are notable features of fast API? Streaming responses, request body validation. You can script it in COBOL. It supports open API, which is Swagger. Or does it support natively something called Golden Dolphin? Let's see. What's your answer? Uh, we may not have enough time yeah. to explain all okay. of this. Okay, Golden Dolphin, as far as I know, does not exist. Again. 
Cobol, no, oh, I nice. don't think FastAPI has any Cobol interface. That's too much of an ancient language for it. FastAPI is very modern, but all other answers are correct. So streaming, request body validation, cool support for open API, Swagger, you've seen the Swagger interface, and a lot of other features. So I actually have to say I appreciate FastAPI a lot. Uh, so, so this question <laughs> yes, it has yes. three correct answers. So. Let's say the funny ones are out and all others are correct. Yeah. Sorry, the, that, was, that choice... was a bit of a yeah. nasty trick. But let's see, let's see the, the effect yeah. on the leaderboard. Okay, Luco Luco, <laughs> Michel and Daniel, congratulations, you are the winners. Luco Luco in particular, you climbed, yeah, Cobble ML, <laughs> yes. You climbed up the ladder and you won. And I think we will just leave Mentimeter open for, because that's very important, you can imagine. We would love to have suggestions on how to improve this workshop. So I leave this open and I thank you if you care to give us some uh, results, some suggestion for uh, future workshops. With that, I can go back to my slides for just the last ones because we are almost done. And uh, yes, so uh, we mentioned that already. If you, if you want to discuss further, beyond the scope of this YouTube uh, chat, which is about to disappear. Please join us on the Discord server and it would be a pleasure to yeah, help you with the workshop or even other things. So please, you're welcome on, on the Discord. There are a lot of very uh, experienced uh, people there on many, many topics. So it would be great to have you. Okay, so of course, please subscribe to this channel, right? So if you have found today's workshop interesting, please sub subscribe and it would be a pleasure to offer you more and more content next time. Uh, I think we can give you a link on where to stay up to date with the upcoming content. So workshops probably, sorry, I mistyped. I can't blame Windows this time. However, it's my fingers. Uh, last thing is, if you complete the course on the Academy, including a small quiz that you see there, you will be able to win this badge, AI is an API, a badge that certifies that you not only followed the, 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 the video, the live, but you also did your part. So please, uh, and this is one of the many badges that we offer. Of course, there are different courses, so stick around and you'll see more. Um, yeah, this is a lot of things that we already told you. By the way, this Academy link is going to be uh, changed. Sorry, I should have changed that. Apologies. You know the new link, uh, but just to make up for my... We, we have both of them. Yes. We have both of uh, them. But they are, I guess they are both... Oh, no, right. New Academy. Right. That's very good. Sorry, I, I, I saw it wrong. Uh, yeah, so this is more about Cassandra or Datastax AstraDB, if you prefer, uh, but this is a lot of things that we mentioned already. I think at this point, I see there are some appreciation on the YouTube chat. Thank you for being with us uh, so far, and I hope it's been useful and fun, maybe, for you. Uh, yeah. And, and please join us in two weeks. Uh, we're going to have uh, introduction to Cassandra workshop, so you will learn more about uh, yes, the database which, by the aspect. way, uh, is one of the winning choices for machine learning workloads for many reasons. Some of them we briefly touched today, but there will be more, so stay tuned. And I think we can bid you farewell. Thank you for staying with us, and uh, we are yeah, ready to keep the conversation on Discord. Yep. Uh, yes. Thank you. Goodbye. See you. Bye. See you soon. And as always, don't forget to click that subscribe button and ring that bell to get notifications for all of our future upcoming workshops. In a being gifted with powers from the goddess of Cassandra, who grew those powers until she could multiply at will, move with limitless speed, and unmask hidden knowledge.
With those powers, she was able to fully understand the connectedness of the world. What she saw was a world in need of understanding. From that day forward, she sought to bestow her powers on all who came into contact with her, empowering them to achieve wondrous feats.